This is not a lasso. But it's really interesting that um, a thing that can that we use or we don't even think about too much, you know, at all until we need it. You know, you need a piece of rope or you need some twine or something. We, you know, we think about it and we then after that we kind of forget. But it's a great illustration. In fact, I'm going to do something that I've, I've always wanted to do. I'm going to tie my son up. Come here. Now hold that, okay? Now, no, I mean, like, hold it right about, right about there. I need some extra. So, okay, put your hands down by your side, okay? And then I get to circle him. Here, I need some help. Lauren, come here. Grab that, hold, pull it, pull it, and, like, bunch it up and follow me around so it doesn't get tangled up, okay? Okay, no, no, this way, darling. You got to walk with me. See, and sometimes, you know, in life we rope people in, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we just, you know, we get people to help us do it. Yeah. Can you breathe? No. Okay, there we go. And we, I'm getting dizzy. I don't know about you. Okay, keep going. We're going to really get him here. Okay. Are you going to stand right there, right? You... What? Oh, I'm really getting dizzy. <laughs> We did it over his face? Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't rope, it was, it was like paper. Okay, there we go. Thank you, darling. Okay, let me see that part there. Okay, ah, there we go. Okay. Okay, and then if I can get this in here, let's see if I can do that. Suck it in, son. What are you saying? Okay. Okay, have a seat. And you're going, what does that have to do with the message? Nothing. I've just always wanted to do that. <laughs> All right, let's have a word of prayer, especially for him. Here we go. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the worship. Thank you, that Lord, that we could sense you and your very presence and your pleasure as we worship you. And Lord, as we look into your word and continue this, this journey through the nativity, through the Christmas narrative, the Christmas story, whatever we may want to call it, the story and, 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 and fact of your birth, I pray that you will open our hearts and open our eyes, as it says in Ephesians, that we may understand Open the eyes of our heart, Lord, and we bless you. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. We don't have to say come because you are already here, because we, we as believers carry you with us. So we say welcome, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. We've been looking at, for the last several weeks, called Away in a Manger, and um, you know, away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. And we love that little song. We, we look forward to it to a point, sometimes on Christmas, that we want to sing it. But we, we sometimes, I think, miss... Can you turn this down just a little bit, brother? It's starting to ring. We, we miss the fact, as we saw in the very first week, that Jesus was fully God, but he was fully human. And the scriptures, as we saw, he understands the things we go through. He faced temptation. He faced hunger. He faced you know, being tired. He faced um, uh, hurt. He faced rejection. He faced all these emotions and all these things that we face. But yet he was fully God. He was tempted, the Bible says, in every way that we are, and, and we were, and we will be, but yet the Bible says he was without sin. And we saw that he was, in the book of Romans, that he was called the second Adam, which means that he obeyed for us. He paid the price for us. He gave us the example of how to walk in this world. And he, and he, and he leads us through the Holy Spirit and gives us the power to do that. We saw last week that he's the son of the Most High. And we like that term. We like it when we, but we saw more 
than we have before what it really means. If he's the son of the most high, then yet, then therefore, he is the most high. He is God incarnate. It's not just a little baby that we remember and we go, oh, it's so cute. He was born. He, he laid down in the hay. If you've ever laid down in the hay, that baby was screaming. Okay? But he was wrapped up, and we, we love that part. We like the fact that he grew up, and we, we hear about him dying for us, and we hear about him being crucified. We hear about him doing miracles. But the fact is, is that that man that we call Christ, that we call Jesus, that walked this earth 2,000 years ago, was God come in the flesh. And if we realize that, and we realize that as believers, we carry the very presence of God through the Holy Spirit in our life, and really tangibly in us, then we're walking with God himself. And, you know, we go, well, wouldn't it be great to have been in the garden? You know, because the Bible says that Adam walked with God, and he walked in the cool of the day, and he walked around. No, we have, a, the Bible says in the book of Romans that we have a better covenant, a better relationship, because we don't just walk with God. God lives in us. Catch that. Let that sink in. Ask the Holy Spirit to, to just impact your life and your mind and, and where you can't think about anything else. God doesn't just walk with us. God lives in us. I mean, that's like, okay, let's go home. Fat chance. Okay, here we go. There's nothing, we've been looking at this little phrase, that there's nothing man-made about the true Christmas story. You know, I, I love the fact that Santa Claus, my favorite Christmas movies are Santa Claus 1, 2, and 3 with Tim Allen, okay? I love those movies. I watch them even during the year if they show up on TV because they're funny, and I like it. I like Tim Allen. I like some of his humor, not all of it, but some of it. But it's not about Santa Claus, but we can enjoy that. We can, I mean, tonight, Santa's going to be here, okay? Hope that doesn't offend anybody. If it does, sorry, okay, but Santa's going to be here. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's nothing man-made about what we truly celebrate. Because Christmas, I even, I mean, my mind's going faster than it can even get anything out. The, this week I was talking to somebody in, a, in another state, a friend, and they were saying, you know, I'm, I'm getting to a point where it's like, I don't want to give any gifts during Christmas anymore. And I went, okay, or conversation just turned a counseling session. Okay, now. I said, why not? And he went, because I, I will, and I know that it blesses, and I know that people, you know, that it's showing that you love somebody, but it's, I'm getting to the point where I want to celebrate just the fact of Jesus being born, because it's his birthday, as we call it. And we need to give gifts to him, which is ourself. And I said, you're right. And he goes, it's almost like we've We've corrupted it. And I went, I, I would tend to agree. But can you change that? And he went, no, I know we, I can't really change any of that. I said, but you can change how you respond. Because you can still give the gifts and still celebrate and put your lights up and still remember the real reason you're doing all this. I said, it's in the heart. The Bible says that the kingdom of God, Jesus says, not out here. Where do you say it was? is within you. This is where it all starts. And there's nothing man-made really about the Christmas story. The Son of the Most High, we looked at last week, means there is no power, no king, no Lord who can oppose or stand against the Son of the Most High and win. If Jesus the child was called the, he says, it says that he will be the Son of the Most High. If he's the son of the Most High, and then later on he becomes king, and we see him coming back in the book of Revelation as king, conquering king, then that means that if he is the son of the Most High, we saw that Most High means that he was over every other king that was ever established or that ever will be established. And if that's true, then there's no king on this earth. There's nothing on this earth that can oppose and stand against him and win. This is that little baby in that manger. I mean, that's like what they say in the Godfather, bada bing, bada boom. It's that, it's, it's that powerful. There's nobody that can oppose him. Now, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Matthew 
This account is where the ga angel Gabriel visits Joseph in a dream. And Joseph is, is, is vexed over what he should do with Mary. He finds out that the woman he loves is pregnant. She probably told him, listen, I'm pregnant, but, but I've been with no man. And it's God that did this. What would most guys do? Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. Okay, and she's probably tried to convince him. And he said, but the Bible says he was a righteous man. And because of that, because of his relationship with God, he says, I'm going to put her away privately. Because why? Because we all know that in, in, in the, the times that the scriptures are written, she would have been killed. She would have been stoned to death in the city that she lived in, or town that she lived in. They would have put her to death because she broke the marriage covenant, because she was betrothed, which was, it was marriage without the ring. That means she had to be faithful, and she became an adulterer. And so an adulterer's death was stoning, according to the law. And he didn't want to see that happen to her. He's a good man. And so he said, listen, I'm just going to put her away privately. So he goes to bed one night. And then Gabriel shows up in his dream. That'd freak you out. And he goes through this narrative and saying, this is what's going to happen to her. You know, happen to, it's what's happening to Mary. And this is what I want you to do. Look what he says in verse 21 of chapter 1 of Matthew. She will bear a son. And you, you, he's talking to Joseph. You shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. And then he goes on and he says more and more. And so Joseph says, okay, I'll do this. I'll do it. I'll marry her. Now, he will save his people from their sins. How many times, now think about it, don't raise your hand, but how many times have we heard that phrase in our walk with Christ? As long as we, if you, some of you have been raised in church, you hear it all the time. And it becomes that same phrase, Jesus died for your sins. Yay! But, you know, I'll be honest with you, even with me, a, a pastor, a preacher, doing this for 40 years, and a Christian longer than that, it, it, it becomes commonplace. Let's get real. It becomes commonplace. You go, no, it doesn't. I bet you it did. Somewhere along the line it did. Because you hear it all the time. It's that same phrase. And you, you agree with it. You think it's great. But the impact of that phrase, the impact of that truth becomes commonplace. And I'm hoping today that when we get done with this, it's no longer commonplace anymore. Let's look at something. The meaning. He says, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The meaning is this. The name Jesus, we know it means what? It's a transliteration of the Hebrew word Yeshua or Joshua. We know this. And it means what? Jehovah is help, or Jehovah saves, or, or something to that effect. But we don't realize this, in most cases, that it was a very common name during the time. It was like Jim or John. It really was. It was a very common name. Joshua was a common name. Yeshua was a common name. Same name. Josephus, one of the historians of, of biblical times, mentions that at least 12 different people he knew with the name Jesus, including four high priests at the time of his living. He knew 12 guys that were named Jesus, and four of them, and at least four high priests that were named Jesus or Joshua. It was common, very common. In Acts chapter 9, we read about the Jewish false prophet Bar-Jesus. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul mentions one of his fellow workers, Jesus, called Justice, changed his name, called Justice, and some ancient manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew refer to the robber. Remember, remember Barabbas? His real name was Jesus Barabbas. Never knew that, did you? Jesus Barabbas. Because why? It means this, Jesus, son of his father. bar Rabbis. Rabbis or Abbas was probably his father. But Abbas also is from the word what? Abba. So it means son of his father or son of daddy. Now this is a common name. 
Now, the root meaning of Jesus, the bottom line, where just the, a literal translation means Yahweh saves. All other men who had those names or had the name Jesus testified by their names of the Lord's salvation. See, we, we look at it as like, okay, he's named Jesus. I don't think there's mistakes, even for people, guys during that time to be named Jesus, because even the Father was allowing that to happen, telling people, get ready. Get ready. We think about names through the, you know, think about it. Did you choose, I hope, you chose your children's names wisely, and there was a reason you chose their names. You thought, you probably thought about it. Unless you were going, oh, what's the most common cool name of the time? Megan. Okay, that was like in the 80s. Megan. Okay, or whatever, Jim. or Je Like, when we were looking at Jesse, I wanted to name him John Wayne Wallace. Wow. Oh, 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 oh. I thought long and hard about that one. Okay. Guess what Denise said? <laughs> She goes, over my dead body. <laughs> and I went, well, we can work on that, kid. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> okay, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. And so then I want to name him Jesse James Wallace. And she goes, he was an outlaw, a murderer. I went, but the name is cool. And she goes, no. I said, how about Jesse Lee Wallace? And she goes, I don't know. And so I went to the Bible because I remember I, I said, okay, I know Jesse. Jesse was David's father. And I looked up what Jesse means. It means Jehovah is or Jehovah exists. And God was put in my heart. He goes, I, Jesse. And I told Denise that, and she goes, that's his name. And then when Linda came along, Linda, Linda, in Spanish, beautiful. And the middle name, L-E-I-G-H, means obedient. means beautifully obedient to God. Stay that way. Okay, now. <laughs> Why did I tell you all that and embarrass my children? Because it's fun. And the second thing, <laughs> the second thing is... <laughs> It's rough being a preacher's kid. It really is. The second thing is this. Do you think the Father just haphazardly named our Savior Jesus? No. Jehovah saves. Now let me show you something. Remember, all the men that were named Jesus during that time, and even today, they testify by their names of the Lord's salvation. Jesus would not only testify of God's salvation, but would himself be that salvation. It wasn't just a testimony anymore. The Son of the Father became the salvation. This was not a haphazardly away in a manger. This was a plan that started before time and then really moved forward in the garden when Adam and Eve purposely chose to rebel against the Father. God, a loving God, says, I'm going to put into, into motion the plan that I have been thinking about for all of eternity because I knew this was going to happen, to redeem these people because I love them back to me. And he put Jesus, as we call, in motion. That's cool. It takes that little narrative away in a minute and it changes it. By his own work, Jesus would save his people from their sins. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says this, and it's one of my favorite verses. For God demonstrates or demonstrated his love towards us, and that while we were still, is the Greek translate, while we were still, while we were presently sinners, it says what? Christ died. For us. When we were presently sinners, Christ died for us. That was, the, most, that was the, the plan. That was what God put in motion. 
The name Jesus is not a magic wand. Chanting it does not give one special powers. And why would I write that down? Because we're charismatics. And most of the time we turn into charismaniacs. And we do stuff that we really don't realize that is, and this is in the Bible, this word is in the New American Standard Version, stupid. It's not a magic wand. Well, I know, Pastor, but it says that at the name of Jesus, people are healed. At the name, yes, but it's not a magic wand. It doesn't give us special powers quoting or, or throwing out the name of Jesus. The power in the name is the person behind the name. We, we, we miss it because we don't live in a society or in a culture today that has a kingdom. We have a government, which is very different, okay? But in a kingdom, when there's a king or a queen or what we call a royal family, when you represent them, you are representing their name, and their name is a representation of the very power that is behind that throne, and all we do is we carry that name, and it was, what is it? It's authority to accomplish what the king told us to do. And many times it was a paper that was a decree that so-and-so can do this, and you carried that with you. And if someone says, what authority are you doing this? Why? What did they tell Jesus? By what authority are you healing these people? Because they understood what a king and a kingdom and, a, and, a, and royalty is what we call it, was. So it's not us chanting the name of Jesus that gives us special power. The power in the name is the person behind the name. In biblical times, names meant something. They were more than badges of identification. They often told others who you were and what purpose God had in your life. What purpose did God have in his life? What was the reason it's the same that when I named Jesse, Jesse, and I named Linda, Linda, that when we finally, when all the fun was done, we, laid, we sat down and we said, we, this is what we're, we, we are praying they will be, that Jesse's life would show God exists and that Linda would walk in absolute obedience before the Lord and her life would, would share the very love and the power of God. There was no mistake to that. And then we prayed over him and prayed over him. We still pray over him. Because why? We gave him that name. And, I, and, I, and I'm sure that you did the same with your children. Because their name represents what? The very purpose that God has on their life. The meaning of the name of Jesus comes down to this. God saves. That's the meaning God saves. And that's as simple without a lot of theological hubbub, okay? That's simply what it means. God saves. Now, the expression of that name is different. The expression of the name, look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Again, he will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Save. Now, in that passage there, that word is the word sozo. So the name where we get the, the name for the ministry, we have sozo here. It means saved, healed, and delivered. Or rescued, healed, and delivered. That's fine. That's great. It says he will save. There's where you take your, if you write in your Bible, which I encourage you to do, it doesn't make it sacrilegious or anything to do that. Circle, it says the, the word he. He will save. He will save. He will save means what? A savior. We hear this all the time. Jesus Christ, my savior. He's the savior of the world. Jesus Christ is my savior. In fact, savior is a very common word also. Savior, Christ, and Lord are all titles. When we say Christ the Lord, Christ and Lord are titles. Christ the savior, title. Christ, title. Jesus, the name. But since the name Jesus means the Lord is salvation, it means it encompasses by the term, by everything else, and encompasses this term, Savior. Turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Y'all still with me? Okay. Luke chapter 2. For all you Star Wars people, go ahead and say it. Okay, now that you got that out of your system. Okay. Luke chapter 2. You want to go, 
you know, but you can't. But the angel said to them, verse 10, the angel said, now let's stop for a second. I love this passage. It's one of my favorite parts of the Christmas story, the shepherds, the scum of the earth. They were. They were considered the very lowest of the lows. Shepherds were not allowed in the temple, even though they were hired by the high priest to, to breed the lambs and the sheep that they would use in sacrifice. But they weren't allowed in the temple. They were considered liars. They were considered um, thieves. They were considered all this. They were just, I, I got times, no time really to go over it too much. But they were outcasts in Israel, even though Israel needed them. They would stay out in the fields. Why do you think when it says that shepherds watch over their flocks by night? Because what they would do during the day, they would be out in the field, and they would let them, kind of let them scatter out. But at night, they would take, take like branches and stuff, and they would make a makeshift pen. And most all the other shepherds would go in after they rounded the sheep up, but there would be one guy that would have the night watch. And there would be sections out on the hill where there would probably be a dozen different makeshift pins and a, probably a dozen or so shepherds out there. And they would have a pin, and I've used this, told this illustration before, and they would make it, and they would call the sheep in. Now, why do you think Jesus said, my sheep know my voice? Because when a, a, a lamb was born, the shepherd would, before the, the mama sheep would, would, would kind of get possession of the lamb, the shepherd would take the lamb and he would hold the lamb, and he would breathe in the nostrils of the lamb, his breath. <sighs> and then he would take the ear, and he would notch the ear a certain way, which made, it put his mark on him. And then he would take the, and he would say the lamb's you know, name. He would, many times they would name the sheep. And he would talk into the ear of that lamb so that the lamb would know his voice. And so that way, during the day, the sheep would mingle with all the other shepherd's sheep. And what would happen, this is true, this is so cool. And the shepherds would go and they would branch out on different areas, like different sections, and they would start calling their sheep. And it was, it's amazing. You can, you can actually, I think, find a couple of things on YouTube showing you this. And what would happen is they would start calling, the sheep would separate, and all the sheep that belonged to that shepherd would go to him because they knew his voice. Why do you think our Lord said that? Amazing, isn't it? And what he would do is he would do this. He would take, and he would stand in, in his makeshift at the corner of the, you know, at the doorway. Why did Jesus call himself, I am the gate? He would stand at the doorway of this makeshift pen, and he would straddle it. And he would call the sheep, and they would come. And as they would come, he would grab their ear and feel for his mark. And he would let them in. But if it wasn't his mark, he'd turn the sheep away. Make sense? And he would come in, and then what happens is once all his sheep were in, he would lay down and become the gate so that the sheep couldn't get out of the pen. This is not man-made. God orchestrated this. That's why he's called the Savior. Let's go on. Watch this. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid. It's to the shepherds. Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news or gospel of great joy, which will be for all the people. Who? All. All. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now stop there. The people under Rome's rule came to call the emperor Savior. And Christians took that word and used it for Christ. We think that Savior was a word that God like invented. Well, it was a common word. Savior means anybody that delivers. Anybody that sets you free. And so here... Rome called Caesar the Savior. But the Christians, when Jesus came, took that word and gave it the true meaning of what it's supposed to be. The description of Jesus as Savior. Now, this I'm going to read you something, and I didn't write this, but I wish I did. 
and I want you to listen very closely. This will probably offend you. The description of, of Jesus as Savior is an appropriate one since the reason he was born was to save his people from their sins. We got that, right? That truth is often blurred in today's presentations of the gospel. Jesus is presented as the one who will rescue people from unfulfillment in their marriages, families, or jobs, from a debilitating habit they cannot overcome on their own, or from a sense of purposelessness in life. But while relief in those areas may be a byproduct of salvation, it is not the primary purpose. It's true. Go to most churches today, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hitting any people. I've done this. And we want people to feel good, and we want them to feel loved, and we want them to feel accepted, and we want them to feel better when they leave. So many times we'll give the byproduct of salvation instead of what salvation really is. This is not about making us feel good. And I'm going to say this, this is not about healing our marriages. This is not about getting us over a habit. This is not about any of that stuff. It's not about us feeling the power of God, which we in the vineyard love. <clears throat> but it's not about any of that stuff. It's about one thing, and it's this. The true gospel message is that Jesus Christ came into the world to rescue people from sin and guilt. Not psychological, artificial guilt feelings, but true, now listen, it's going to offend you, but true God-imposed guilt that condemns one to hell. We think that our purpose is to take somebody and get them past their guilty feelings. And do you know we do them injustice by doing that? Because guilt comes from God initially. And you're going, no, it doesn't. Let me show you something. Look up the word guilt in the, in the Bible, and it's in there. It's in there, and it's talking about this. But the word guilt scripturally, and from the Greek, it means this. Now listen to me. It means responsibility. It means source. It means cause. Who sinned? We did. Who rebelled? We did. Who was born in sin? We were and are. Who chooses to disobey God? Even as believers, we do. But what we try in churches today is when someone says, I just feel so bad. Don't feel bad. God's going to take away that guilt. God says guilt is not of the Lord. That's of the devil. So we just rebuke that guilt and that shame. Nowhere in the Bible does it talk about that. God uses that to get us to a point where we understand that we are sinners. And before we can get saved, we have to understand something, that we have sinned against God. If we don't understand that, why do we need a Savior? This is the gospel. We rebelled against God. And that guilt is because of that. And God allows that guilt in there. That came with the sin. Now the byproduct when we do get saved is that God will free us from that, and he'll move us past that. But quit using that as the purpose to get saved. The purpose to get saved is to be delivered and to be forgiven of our sin. The true gospel message, I'm going to read it one more time, is that Jesus Christ came into the world to rescue people from sin and guilt. Not psychological, artificial guilt feelings, but true God-imposed guilt that condemns one to hell. We've got to understand something, my friends. Without Christ, we will spend, or and others will spend eternity in hell. And when we start understanding that, it will begin to break our hearts. Because we always say, oh God, break our hearts, so what breaks yours? That's a favorite thing in the vineyard. I hear it all the time. And I want to go, what breaks his heart? Oh, people just, you know, this and people. No, what breaks his heart is people going to hell. Bottom line. Bottom line, 
That breaks his heart. That tells, that, 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 that aches the heart of God. If it didn't, why would he send Jesus? Remember I said last week that Jesus, the word glory means opinion. We think of it always as this wonderful light that comes down or this feeling, this goosebumps. We feel the glory. It doesn't. It means opinion. And we saw that Jesus Christ was God's perfect opinion on everything. And if he was perfect opinion on everything, what was, why did he send him? To save people from their sins. That was his opinion. That's what's on God's heart. Salvation and of, of man is on God's heart. But it's not on ours. If, we, if it was, we would understand the Christmas story different. So the expression of the name of Jesus, the expression of it is Savior. Savior. The meaning is God saves. The expression is Savior. Now I want to show you some. The intent and scope. Look with me again to Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The intent and scope is this. The intent is Matthew 121, where we saw it says, he will save his people from their sins. In the most complete sense, he will do this. There's nothing lacking. He will. And the word will is an emphatic. And it means this is going to happen. And it's complete. And there's nothing missing. That's the beauty of it. We, when we do stuff, we usually, take for instance, how many times, guys, have you put something together, and when it's all together, there's two or three screws laying on the floor? <laughs> Don't answer that. And we will never say that it's because we didn't read the instructions until the last minute. Okay? Because, yeah, I can put that together. Yeah, I know how it goes together. And then when the wife leaves, you go, I don't have any idea how this thing goes together. But we have two or three screws left. Or, you know, when we, we get done and we get done writing a, a letter, we go back and we change it again because we didn't, it didn't really say what we wanted it to say in the first place. That's why we have, what, spell check and erase and pay, cut and paste. Okay? And the, the old-fashioned, old school is called whiteout. All right? And why? Because we would go back and change. Because it wasn't complete. It wasn't right in the first time. But what this means here is it says he will save his people. From, listen to me. Hear me. I know you're, going, you're, you're, you're hitting this hard. Yes, there's a purpose for this. He will save his people from their sins. It's complete. There's nothing lacking. When we give our lives to Christ by repenting of our sins, by asking him to forgive us of our sins, and turning our life over to him, God saves completely. That's what the word sozo. He saves, heals, and delivers. It's a complete work. And that work started before we were born. And then when we got saved, it came upon us through Christ. And then it will carry us through the present. And then in the future, it will be absolutely visible, the completeness of it, because we will spend eternity in heaven as perfect, perfect, perfect. Positionally, I'm perfect. I keep telling my wife that. And she goes, okay. No, she doesn't. She goes, I know you are, dear. But I I'm, I'm perfect. Well, positionally in Christ, I am. Positionally, I'm seated in the heavenlies. Positionally, I am seated with Christ, in Christ, it says, literally in Christ, and he is in me. So I'm positionally perfect, but right now he's sanctifying me, and he's making me holy, he's consecrating me, he's changing me, he's forming me into his image, and then that final day where I step over from this side into what we call the promised land, when I step over the Jordan and I step, step into heaven, I will be perfectly complete. But I was there too. Wow. That is because he will save completely, 100%, all work done. That's why Jesus said it is finished. Now, that's the intent. But let me show you something. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. We're going to wrap this up. Revelation chapter 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at, look at verse 5.
This is John writing to the seven churches. He says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, which is cool, the firstborn of the dead, which means what? He was the first resurrected, okay? Firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And we saw that last week, didn't we? Ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Now, let me show you something. Jesse, come here for a minute. Okay, now let me, let me ask you something. Did Jesse put up a fight for me to do this? No, he didn't. What did I do? I asked him, I said, hey, Jesse, come here, I want to tie you up. What did he do? He volunteered. He walked over. And I even said, hold this rope for me. Durr. Okay? <laughs> I said, hold this rope. And what did he do? Held the rope. And then I got, a, I got Lauren to help me tie him up. And I said, come here, Lauren. And she, what did she do? Okay. <laughs> I said, Lauren, pick up the rope for me and follow, me, follow behind me. She goes, okay. <laughs> and we're walking around. And we just kept walking around. And Lauren keeps walking around with me. And Jesse keeps standing there going. <laughs> and then I got into the front. And I even said, suck it in. Come on, I've got to tie you up. I'm going to put a knot in this. And he let me do it, didn't he? That's us. How many times do we just blatantly allow the enemy to tie us up? He goes, come here. And we go, okay. We walk over. And then he'll, he'll, he'll get somebody else to help us do it too. And then we get all this done, which restrains him. But Jesus, it says this, he came, look at me, stay right there, don't move. Chapter 1, verse 5 again, look at it. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, I'll stop there. He loves us. He loves us. And it's not that song that we sing, oh, how he loves us. He loves us. He loves us. That was the motivating factor for all that he did. He loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. That means the blood of Jesus Christ released us. And you go, what does release mean? Let me tell you something. It means this. It means to unbind. It means to untie. So the blood of Jesus, when we were bound up, Jesse came to Jesus one day. And he said, Jesus, save me. Forgive me of my sin. And God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, looked him straight in the face and said, I love you, and I'm going to untie you. And he untied him, and he took the ropes off of him. And he took his time sometimes, and he took the rope off of him. <laughs> no, he is. You know what this is? This is called sanctification. Progressive salvation. It's all done at one time, but we're learning, aren't we? Do you think Jesse or any one of us will go right back into some type of sin in our life? Yeah, you will. I've done it. And we come back and we say, God, untie us. We repent. And he says this, I've been untying you for a long time. It's my job. It's what I do. That's why they call me Savior. And so... All through your life, Jesse, I'm untying you. And when that day comes, when you, I call you home, this is what it's going to be. That's what the Savior is. The scope, that's the intent. The scope is this. You're the scope. I'm the scope. Look what he says. Go back to, to uh, Luke chapter, two, chapter 2. Look at verse 11, 2.11, Luke 2.11. 
For today in the city of David, there has been born for who? For you. That's the scope. The intent was to save. The scope was all of us. Jesus himself will show that the kingdom of heaven includes all those who, all those and only those who have the reign of God in their hearts and lives. The intent and the scope of the name of Jesus is this. He will save you. That's it. That's why I weigh in a manger. No crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask you to stay. Close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care and take us to heaven to live with thee there. That's what it's about. There's nothing man made about the true Christmas story. Christmas is this. The visible entrance of the masterfully designed plan of the Most High God to redeem his people from their sin through his Son, who he named Jesus. That's it. Tonight we're going to celebrate Christmas. We're going to have a great time together. But the reason we do this is because of this. And there's some of you in here, and even in the small amount that we have this morning, there's somebody in here that if you died, you would spend eternity in hell. Because you've never come to that point where you said, Lord, forgive me of my sin. You've been going to church a long time. I've seen more people that go to church most all their life and get saved near the end. Because we get a false security that because we go to church, it makes us a Christian. Like I said before, you can sit in a garage and it won't make you a car. You wish you could sit there and go, rah, 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 rah. Yeah. doesn't make you a car. You can pick up a guitar, it won't make you a musician. You can go to church all your life, <clears throat> or you can hang out with Christians and it doesn't make you a Christian. A Christian means little Christ, follower of Christ. And that means that he is now Lord and Savior in your life, and that you've repented of your sin. This morning, there's some of you going, you know, you were talking about the guilt, Ron, you were talking about, I have this guilt. Well, today it can be laid down by repentance. Lord, forgive me. It goes back to that. You know, I used to say this in a youth group when I was a youth pastor. It's not a game. And that was before we had all these games, video games. It's not a game. This is not a joke. This is not something we just do. This is, this is dealing with eternity. Eternity. Either heaven or hell. And I'm not afraid to preach about hell. Because without Christ, we will spend eternity in hell. Absolute torment and separation from God. And let me tell you something. It's not the flames that is the torment. The torment is that God is not there. Forever, totally separated from God himself. We were made to know God. We were made, to be, we were made as, as temples of the Most High, to be temples. Let God overturn the tables in your temple today. Let him kick out the thieves and the robbers and let him change your life life. Let's pray. Just bow your heads for a moment. Begin to pray. Seek the Lord. Holy Spirit, we ask you to move right now. Move in our lives. Convict. Encourage. Do what it needs to happen this morning. If there's someone here this morning that doesn't know you, I pray that right now that in a prayer, they repent of their sin. Ask you to forgive them. 
and ask you to be the Savior and Lord of their life. Save this morning, Lord. This morning, for the, if there's anyone, Lord, that has walked away from you and this is their first time back in church for a while, or they maybe have been sitting in church all their life, but they've never really walked with you, may that happen today. Lord, if there are those that need healing this morning, may they get prayer. May they step out in faith. Lord, do your work. Holy Spirit, do what you do best, which is glorify Jesus. Lord, do your work. Keep your heads bowed. Seek Him. Seek Him right now. This moment is a moment in eternity. It's been designated from all eternity right to now. Take a moment. Where are you with Jesus? Where are you? prayer this morning for healing. Come. There's people up here right now that will be able to pray for you in just a moment. If you need anointing with oil, that will be happy to do that. I believe God heals. And I believe He heals creatively and drastically and dramatically. But if you need, if you want somebody to talk with you about, about your walk with Christ and somebody to pray for you, then come in just a moment. Whatever the need is, this morning, God can meet it. And we're going to worship. And just spend a few moments. If you need prayer, come. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that you will do your work. That you will do your work. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, as Kelly leads us. Come. Let's stand. Let's stand.
So, Lord, I ask that, Lord, as we go in just a few moments, that, Lord, we will walk forward in the very power of your presence in our life, a refreshed, renewed relationship, Lord, and a greater awareness that you are the Son of the Most High, which means you are the Most High God. And, Lord, we bless you, and we may walk in your great love and the assurance of your love and salvation. Jesus' name, and all God's people said. Two quick things as ministry is going on. We got to set up for the uh, 